that are online. Just access that QR code. It'll take you to the online version of the Connect card, and you can fill it out as well, and we greatly appreciate and we trust you'll feel welcome, and the service will be a blessing to you. Let me remind you of a few announcements. Let me encourage you to be back this evening at 6 o'clock for our Christmas Night of Music presented by Abbott's Creek Children and Sanctuary Choir, and I'm sure Andrew will have more to say about that as well, but let me encourage you again. That's at 6 o'clock this evening. And then our Christmas Eve service on Christmas Eve at 5 p.m., and that's always a beautiful time. So remember these things uh, tonight at 6 o'clock and then Christmas Eve at 5 o'clock. I want to go to the Lord in prayer here this morning, then Andrew will come and lead us in worship. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, you are a good God and a gracious God, and we are so thankful to you for all the blessings that we have in Christ Jesus knowing that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ, knowing that we have been given everything pertaining to life and godliness in Christ, knowing, Father God, that every good and perfect gift comes from you. And during this Christmas season, we reflect upon the greatest gift of all, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And it's our prayer, Lord God, that here at Abbots Creek Missionary Baptist Church, that the name of Jesus would be lifted up here today. Lord, that if there are individuals in this sanctuary or joining us online who do not know Jesus as their Savior, that today would be the day that your Spirit moves in their hearts, draws them to yourself, and saves them. Father God, that they embrace the greatest gift of all, Jesus. And Father God, I pray you would bless Pastor Steve as he comes and preaches that which you've laid upon his heart, that which he's prepared and studied, and that our hearts and our minds would be open and receptive to the word and that would be driven deep and would bear much fruit to your honor and glory. For those in our church family and extended family who are dealing with illnesses and struggles and trials and difficulties, would you give them encouragement? Would they know your presence? Would they know your power? Would they know your grace? Father God, for those in our midst and those that are joining us in worship whose hearts are heavy, who are burdened down, maybe especially during the Christmas season, would they be able to leave this place renewed? Would they find joy in their hearts because of Jesus? Father God, we thank you. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins that is available. We thank you for the hope that is available all in Jesus. And we thank you, Lord God, for what you're going to do here today in this place. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. good morning. So good to see you all in your Christmas colors today. You look very festive. Um, like Josh said earlier, we are having a night of music tonight here in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. I hope that we will see you here tonight for that. We've been working on this music since August, so it's been a very long time coming. So I hope that you will come and join us. We'll have the kids' choir. Say, hey, kids. And then we'll have the adult choir in the second half. So we hope that you will come and support your friends in the choir and the kids' choir, but all in all to glorify the Lord. And I hope that you'll be blessed with our music tonight. Also, next week on Sunday morning, we will have guest musicians. Um, it's a trio called Mercy's Well. You might have heard them. They're based out of Greensboro. Sometimes they're on the radio. I encourage you to look them up on YouTube and Spotify. They're, they're very good. We're blessed to have them next week, so I hope that you will come. Bring a friend. I hope that you'll be blessed with their music. So let's make some music of our own this morning. Let's stand and sing to our Lord and Savior as we start with Crown Him with Many Crowns.
Amen. Let's sing together, crowned by the angel choir. Crowned by the angel choir, they tell his royal birth. Sing glory in the highest height and peace upon the earth. They break the silent night, announcing in this land the King of grace and love is here. Oh, crown him all the world. Crown by the
Good morning. Today we relight the first three candles of the Advent wreath, the candles of hope, peace, and joy. Now we light the fourth candle of Advent. This is the candle of love. Jesus demonstrated self-giving love in his ministry as the Good Shepherd. Advent is a time for kindness, thinking of others, and sharing with others. It is a time to love as God has loved us by giving us his most precious gift. As God is love, let us be love also. In the book of Deuteronomy, we find these words. For the love, excuse me, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribe, who executes justice for the orphan and the widow, and who loves the strangers, providing them food and clothing. You shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17 through 19a. From the Gospel of John we hear, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. John chapter 13, verse 34 through 35. Let us pray. Teach us to love, O Lord. May we always remember to put you first as we follow Christ's footsteps, that we may know your love and show it in our lives as we prepare for our celebration of Jesus' birth. Also, fill our hearts with love for the world, that all may know your love in the one whom you have sent, your Son, our Savior. Amen.
Amen. Thank you all so much. What a blessing this morning. It's good to see everybody today. If you would turn in your Bibles, not to Colossians today, but to the book of Luke. And we're going to be in chapter 2 in just a minute, verses 4 through 20. Luke chapter 2, verses 4 through 20. I uh, asked them if they could, at the, kind of at the last minute, to put a slide up here of a photograph. If you guys would pop that photograph up here. How many of you have seen that photograph before? Okay, quite a few of you have seen that photograph before. Just leave that up there during this uh, story. It was August of 1945 when this took place. The Second World War was coming to a close, and the Allied nations had already celebrated VE Day, which was victory in Europe with the surrender of the German Nazi forces. And since then, the U.S. Navy had been island hopping through the Pacific and was nearing the main Japanese island and was thinking about whether or not to invade Japan or to drop the atomic bombs. Of course, we know that the bombs were dropped and that effectively ended the war. But the everyday soldiers around the country and around the world, a lot of them didn't know that this had actually happened. The man in this photo is George Mendonza, a Navy quartermaster serving in the Pacific. But he happened to be home on leave in New York City at the time. And he was taking this girl named Rita to a movie in Midtown Manhattan. And during the middle of the movie, they stopped the movie, they turned on the lights, and they announced that the Japanese had surrendered and the war was over. Everybody flooded the streets, and, and basically George and Rita ended up in Times Square where this took place. That's George. Problem is, that's not Rita. <laughs> Somewhere in the midst of the celebration, George got so excited, he just grabbed a nurse and kissed her. Rita later said that she was okay with it because of the excitement of the greatest news that the war was over. And in fact, Rita and George ended up being married over 70 years. The nurse, however, they say, was not all that happy about it. <laughs> but this was one of the greatest celebratory moments in the history of our great country. A great news that the war was over. But this morning, we want to talk about the fact that that's not the greatest news that's ever been announced. The greatest news that was ever announced is that God sent His Son to this earth to die on the cross for our sins so that we could have victory over sin and death. And that's what we celebrate when we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. As we think about Christmas I want you to think about this morning all the different things that kind of get into our minds at the Christmas season. It's a busy time of the year, is it not? I have an idea that the next several days are going to be pretty busy for a lot of folks. You're going to be running here and there. You're going to be, those of you that are married and have in-laws, you're going to be running to this family and that family and grandma's house and grandpa's house and this, this person and this person. And you just run, run, run. And then you've got some church things that are in there as well. It's a very busy time of the year. Our focus tends to get on uh, the, the songs of this particular holiday. Our focus tends to get on uh, the, the wrapping of presents, the Christmas trees, the lights, and all the different things that go with Christmas. But what should we make sure that we don't forget when we're celebrating Christmas as believers in Christ? Maybe today, the busyness of the holiday and all the other stuff has prevented you from really thinking about what it's really all about. And why particularly when we see Jesus in a manger, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us? Maybe your temptation at Christmas is only to celebrate his birth, but there's so much more than that. So think about that as we dig into this passage this morning. If you're able to stand with me as we read from the Word of God, we'll read verses 4 through 20. We're reminded that all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Listen to what it says. 
Joseph also, also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were greatly afraid. And then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let's now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told to them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. You can be seated. The main idea I want you to take away from this great story is this. Good news. God sent us a Savior. God sent us a Savior. That's the focus this morning is who He sent and why He sent Him. He sent us a Savior. Uh, you'll notice in this text that we just read, it was time in verses 6 and 7, it was time for Jesus to be born. Uh, they had gone to Bethlehem. Mary gave birth to Jesus, wrapped Him up in the swaddling clothes, laid Him in the manger uh, because there was no room in the inn. But down in verse 11, the Bible tells us specifically, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a what? A Savior who is Christ the Lord. Yes, it was a baby, but it wasn't just any baby. It was a Savior who was Christ the Lord. So when we talk about Christmas and we talk about the birth of Jesus, we're talking about the coming of a Savior. The world was in desperate need of a Savior. Before we go any further in this story today, why in the world did God have to send us a Savior? The Bible teaches us that all of us have sinned against God. Our sin separates us from God. We cannot be in a relationship with our God because of our sin. There is nothing that you can do, nothing that I can do to save ourselves from our sin. Only God could do something, and He did. He sent His own Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us that we might be saved from our sin. Praise God, He sent us a Savior. So as we dig into that further, three specific truths that I want you to consider today. And the first is this. The good news of a Savior is for all people. Let me say that again. The good news of a Savior is for all people. So going a little further into the passage, starting in verse 8, it says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields. When we were over in Israel a couple of years ago, uh, in Bethlehem, they took us out and they showed us the fields where many of the shepherds had their sheep, a beautiful area there. And they were out in the fields. They were keeping watch over the flock by night. Imagine being a shepherd in that day, there in your field, tending to your flock, and all of a sudden, this angel in verse 9, an angel stands before them. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Wouldn't you be afraid if an angel with the glory, the splendor of God, the brightness, the I'm sure it was a, 
a, a heavenly light around this angel showed up and started talking to you, you'd be scared too. So they're, they're in fear as they're doing this. But the angel knows that. And the angel says in verse 10, don't be afraid. And then he says this, I bring you good tidings, good news of great joy. You know, sometimes we get so busy with the Christmas season that we forget that we're celebrating something joyous. Uh, sometimes we sing joy to the world, and we sing it like, joy to the world, the Lord is come. And we're just not happy at all. we got something joyous to praise the Lord about. When we come in here on Christmas Day and every day of the year that we come together, we have something to be joyous about. When you go out there in your job, in your school, wherever God takes you on a daily basis, you have something to be joyous about. We live with great joy news, good tidings of great joy. But notice what it says in verse 10. It says, which will be to how many people? To all people. It is to everyone, not just certain individuals. Uh, we can't categorize uh, the gospel and put it in a box and say it's just for a few. The good news is for everybody. God sent his son into the what? Into the whole world. God sent His Son to the world. He loved the whole world enough to send His Son. He sent Jesus to save the world from its sins. It is for every individual. And there's some people who say, Well, Pastor, it's not for me because I've done too much. I, I've done too much. I've sinned so greatly against God that there's no way the gospel could possibly be for me. May I say to you that the gospel is for you no matter what you've done. And we have all, we like to categorize sins and say, well, this person did this. That's much worse than this and this and this. If you've sinned at all, you deserve death and separation from God, right? That's what we all deserve. So the good news is he came for everybody. He came and he died for all people, this is the good news. Back in the 1930s, the NFL draft began. And in 1976, they decided to give a title to the last man drafted in the NFL draft. The very end of the draft, after all these rounds of draft picks, they come to the end and it's finally the last pick. And the guy who gets picked last, anybody know what he's called? Nobody? Mr. Anybody? Come on. Mr. Irrelevant. Mr. Irrelevant. Did you know that people feel so sorry for Mr. Irrelevant because they hardly ever make the team? There's only a few in the history who were Mr. Irrelevant that ever actually made a team and got to play in the NFL. And people felt so sorry for Mr. Irrelevant that they now send Mr. Irrelevant to California to one of the beaches and they throw a party for him. <laughs> Mr. Irrelevant. And what I've learned is, though, you don't really want to be known as Mr. Irrelevant. In the NFL draft, there's a guy that just doesn't matter. You will never find that when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everybody matters. Every single person matters. There is not one of you that is irrelevant. There is not any individual anywhere in the world that is irrelevant. God sent His Son, Jesus, to every single person on the earth that's ever lived. He sent Him with the good news that you can be saved from your sins. The good news is for all people. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, Listen to what it says. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. The Bible says, he Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants all men to come to the knowledge of the truth. In the famous verses that we often quote in John chapter 3 and verse 16. Listen to what it says. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world, the what? The world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Listen to this. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. 
the world might be saved. That's what Scripture teaches us. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Bible says that God is not slack concerning His promise, as some would count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that how many? Any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. No matter what you have done, no matter who you are, no matter what family background you come out of, no matter what nation you were born into, what people group you belong to, no matter who you are, where you are, where you're from, what you've done, or any of that, God sent His Son Jesus to die for your sins. That's good news, my friends. So we praise the Lord for that. It is for every single person. Go back over to Luke <clears throat> chapter 2 again. And there's a second truth I want you to see. The good news of a Savior should be shared. It should be shared. So <clears throat> look what else happens here as we dig on down into the text. Verse 12. This will be the sign to you. You're going to find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. And he's going to be lying in a manger. The Bible goes on to say, we'll come back to verses 13 and 14 in just a little bit. Uh, the angels appeared. They sang glory to God in the highest. But then it says in verse 15, So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven <clears throat> that the shepherds said, now look at it, that the shepherds said, well, let's go back to watching our sheep and take a little nap. Is that what it says? Oh, it doesn't. And the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord made known to us. So the first thing is they wanted to see what had happened. They, they heard the story, and now they wanted to see it. They wanted to, to realize it, experience it in person. They came, verse 16, they came with haste. They found Mary and Joseph and the babe there lying in the manger, just as the angel had said. And you can imagine their faith was beginning to increase as they saw him there, just as the angel had said. And then the Bible says in verse 17, And when they had seen him, they went back to their fields and took care of their sheep and just kept to themselves. Is that what happened? No, when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. So these shepherds, they, they couldn't hold it in. They, they couldn't keep it in. They had to let it out, what they had seen. They had, been, had seen an angel, and this angel had told them about this baby wrapped in swaddling clothes in a manger. And they went, and there it was, just like the angel had said. And they were amazed, and they went back, and they just had to tell everybody that they saw what they had seen. They had met Jesus, and they couldn't hold it inside of them any longer. That's what Scripture says. The reality of it is, is that the good news of a Savior is to be shared. It is to be shared. Are we sharing it? I remember in 1998, this is before I was a pastor. This is what the trip actually that kind of led to me being a pastor. I went with a group of, of people from... Churches all over the United States, I helped lead a team from Green Street Baptist. I wasn't a member there at the time, but I was asked to lead their team of about 30. 300 of us went over to Ukraine, and for 10 days in 10 big cities along the Dnieper River, we went out, we went into the schools, we went into the orphanages, we went into the hospitals, we went into the streets and witnessed. We grabbed bullhorns up and preached, even if you'd never preached before in the street, we gave out thousands and thousands of Bibles and witness to people all over the country there. And we were in the city of Kremenchuk. And I remember standing on the street and I stopped this young girl. She looked like she might have been 20 years old. Her name was Olga. And I said, uh, would, you, would you listen for just a moment to something I want to share and I've got a gift for you. And I handed her a Bible in her language. 
And I started talking to her about Jesus. This young girl stood there with all kinds of questions. Brought up in the Russian Orthodox Church with all kinds of misinformation. Had no clue what it really meant to be saved. It took one hour of standing there talking to her and answering her questions back and forth. And after an hour of conversation, she prayed and asked Jesus Christ to save her from her sins. And we celebrated there in the street. She took her Bible and she left. And honestly, I thought I'd never see her again. About 15 minutes passed and here she came down from her apartment complex with 10 more people who stood there and heard the gospel, and seven of the ten prayed to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. I said goodbye, thought I'd never see her again. That night we held a crusade from the ship deck with preachers preaching and singers singing and the rest of us mingling around and talking to people out there who had gathered. And I looked out there, I was singing that night, and I looked out there, And I saw her standing there. She brought her mom, her dad, her two sisters, and a whole group of people with her. And many of them came to know Jesus Christ. That young lady met Jesus, and she just could not hold it in. And that's the way we all should be. We have got too good a news not to share it. I read one time, I may not quote this exactly the way he said it, but I read one time the actor Kirk Cameron said this, if we had the cure to cancer, if you had the cure to cancer, would you share it with people? And certainly we would. And then he said, you have the cure to sin and death. Aren't you going to share it with people? Are we sharing the good news? You say, well, we do that at Easter. Well, do it at Easter, but let's do it at Christmas, and let's do it every day of the year, because the good news is for everybody, and there are people in your life that you will meet that I will not meet. There are people in my life that I will meet that you will not meet, and it's up to all of us to share the good news with the people that we run into. The Bible says in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have commanded, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. The Bible says in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8, that we shall be His witnesses unto Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. The Bible says at the end of every single one of the Gospels to go and preach Jesus for the remission of sins. We are commanded to go. But listen, even if we weren't commanded to go, isn't it good enough news that we should be sharing it? Share the good news of the gospel. I'm pretty sure I've already said this here in the short time I've been here, but I'll say it again because some people always say, I don't know how to do it. I don't know what to share. I need somebody to to teach me. Listen, there's nothing wrong with training people how to share the gospel and, and helping people improve at that. But here's what I said before, and I really want us to think about it. If you know enough to be saved, you know enough to share it. That's it. If you know that you were a sinner and your sin condemned you to death to be separated from God forever, if you knew that, and, and you had to know that in order to be saved, and if you know that Jesus came down here and died on the cross for your sins, was dead and buried, and rose again from the grave, and I hope that every Christian knows that. Surely we do. Okay? And you know that if you call on Him as your Savior, He's going to save you from your sins. That's enough. It doesn't have to be fancy. You don't have to use big preacher words. You don't have to use theological terms like glorification and sanctification and justification. You don't have to use all that. Just tell them how you were a sinner, Jesus died for your sins, and you called on Him to save you, and He saved you. That's it. Okay? And let me tell you something. That is the greatest news that's ever been. 
And that's why we celebrate a manger. That's why we celebrate a baby in a manger. Not because He was born, because He was born to die for our sins. That He was buried and alive. And that if you call on Him, you can be saved. God sent a Savior. That's who He sent. And that's the good news worth sharing. So let's share the good news. Let's tell people about it. At Christmas, take the opportunity to tell your friends and your neighbors and your family that don't know Jesus. Take a minute to tell them why He came. What it's really all about. That's what we need to do. So share it. The good news of a Savior should be shared. I've got one last truth I want you to see. And that is this, the good news of a Savior should give rise to worship. It should give rise to worship. So look what happens. First of all, we got the angels sharing good news. And we see in verse 13, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host. And what were they doing? They were praising God and saying. So you just thought they were having a little talk with the shepherds. But they were actually doing what? Praising God. While they're talking to the shepherds, they're praising God. So they're praising God. And what are they doing? They're saying, they're not, they're not saying this just to the shepherds. They're saying it to God. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Glory to God. The message of Jesus coming in a manger to die for our sins deserves glory to God. And the angels did that. They worshipped God in that moment. Now go down to verse 19. The Bible says that Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. But look at verse 20. Then the shepherds returned. Now they've already gone about telling everything they saw, sharing the good news But now they go back to their job. They go back to the fields. They go back to take care of the sheep. And the Bible says the shepherds returned. And what were they doing? Glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. The shepherd's response to the great message that a Savior was born who would save their sins was to leave there not the same. Not telling shepherd stories on the hillside, but praising God and glorifying Him. The good news of a Savior should well up in us worship. Worship. Now worship is lots of things. Worship is praising God. Vocally praising God, singing praises to God, shouting praises to God, playing instruments to God. All this is in the Psalms uh, that we're doing. We're praising God, we're glorifying God, we're giving Him honor and glory. Always. When we sing, a while ago we heard some of the most beautiful music you'll hear anywhere in the world. All right? But it's not just, oh wow, that was pretty. That was great. The tones were so pretty. The, the, the notes were so beautiful. The soft notes were blending so well and all of that. Great. But it should cause you and I to engage God in worship. That's the purpose of the music. That's the purpose of the preaching. That the Word of God goes into us, changes us, and the response to that should be glory to God, worship of God, giving our body as a living sacrifice to God, giving our minds to God, and responding in praise and worship for who God is. The reason we exist as a people is to glorify God. So the birth of Jesus gave rise to worship in the life of the shepherds, and it should do the exact same thing in us. In 2016, the Chicago Cubs did something they had not done in 108 years. 108 years. They had not won the World Series. 108 years. The city had been waiting for that day. 
when they would finally win the World Series. And in 2016, it happened. I watched it. I was kind of pulling for the Cubs. I mean, the underdog, you know, I was kind of pulling for the Cubs. And throughout the playoffs, I kept hearing them sing this song. And it was kind of catchy. And, and after a little while, I was like, found myself on the couch singing this song. I didn't even know anything about it, just like singing it. And it was like, go Cubs, go. Go Cubs, go. Hey, Chicago, what do you say? The Cubs are going to win today. Go Cubs, go. Go Cubs, go. Hey, Chicago, what do you say? The Cubs are going to win today. And I was singing that over and over again. The fans are singing it during the games. It's got verses and all that. I'll spare you that this morning. But it's got all these verses and everything. They're all singing it. When they won the game, I literally, I turned up the volume on the TV to listen to this. 42,000 Cubs fans in the stands, and they're all together on their feet. Everybody. They scanned the audience. There wasn't a Cub fan anywhere in the building that wasn't singing, Go Cubs, go. Go Cubs, go. Hey, Chicago, what do you say? The Cubs are going to win today after they won the World Series. It reverberated around the stadium. There were videos later shown where people were out in the streets of Chicago and heard them singing in the stadium. 42,000 people singing, The Cubs are going to win today. Amazing thing. Three days later, they had a parade. A huge parade. Five million people showed up in Chicago for the parade that the Cubs won. It is the seventh largest gathering in the history of the world and the largest gathering in the history of the United States. And they were all singing, Go Cubs, go! Go Cubs, go! Hey Chicago, what do you say? The Cubs are going to win today. And shouting to the top. Everybody was doing it. And this is over a baseball game. Let that sink in a minute. Don't we have something better to sing about and praise about? Isn't it worth us shouting about? Praising Him openly about? singing about, you say, Pastor, I can't sing. Do you think for one moment that all those people in that stadium could sing? <laughs> the Bible says make a what kind of noise? You say, well, Pastor, if I sing, it won't be joyful to the people next to me. <laughs> May I tell you something? You are not singing for the people next to you. There's one audience, and that's Him. So sing it. Shout it. Say it. Share it. But for what God has done for us in saving us from our sins, it's worth sharing, and it should rise up, cause to rise up within us. Worship. Praise. and Glory. And honor to the one who sent him, to the one who loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son, that if you would believe in him, you would not perish, but have everlasting life. Praise be to him. Will you bow your heads with me? As we come to our time of invitation, Maybe there's somebody in the room that, or watching online, you would just say, Pastor, I don't know that that's ever happened to me. I don't know that there's ever been a time where I believed on Jesus and called on Him to be my Savior and Lord. But I want that. I want that. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. And listen, you... You don't know that you'll have it tomorrow. You may, you may not. So make today the day of your salvation. You say, well, I don't, I don't know what to do. Here's what I want you to do. If you're in the room, Pastor Josh and I will be down here when we stand to sing in a second.
You come grab one of us. All you need to do is say, I want to be saved or I want to pray to receive Christ. And we'll walk you through that. If you're watching online, here's what you can do. Right where you are, right now. You can just admit to God that you have sinned against Him and ask Him to save you from your sins and be your Lord and Savior. Just, just ask Him that in your own words. But just ask Him to save you. Listen, He's not so much worried about the exact words that you say as He is your heart and what it's feeling in the moment. So you just pray and ask Him to save you. And then I want you to let us know what you did because we'll need to follow up with you and talk to you about what's next. So reach out to us. All across the room and watching, maybe you want to join our church today. You reach out to us, either come forward or reach out to us this week and just tell us you want to join the church and we'll walk you through that process. But everywhere, how are you responding to the gift of a Savior that came? Are you telling all people, do you realize that you can be saved no matter what you've done? If you're already a believer, are you sharing the good news? Is it something you want to tell other people about? If not, why not? And are you sharing it with everybody, no matter who they are, no matter what background they're from, what culture they're from, what religion they belong to? And is it causing you to worship Him? And if not, pray and ask God to change your heart today. To change you. To renew your mind that you might be who He called you to be in response to His saving you. Father, move in the hearts of everyone in this room right now, I pray. And lead us to decisions that would bring glory to Your holy name. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Standing as we sing, you come if God is speaking to you. for being here this morning. I think our kids are, are the kids doing something? All right. I don't know what's next, so I'm sorry. <laughs> what's next? Just they'll play a song. Okay.
think about what God has done for you. Father in heaven, God, thank you for a great day of worship, just being together in your house, whether it's in the room or watching online, that we can gather together as the body of Christ and celebrate why you came. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to speak to our hearts from your word. Holy Spirit, that you would work in our hearts and change what needs to be changed. And I pray, Lord, that we will leave this place and for the rest of our lives that we would share the greatest news ever, that a Savior came to give us victory over our sins and death, that we might live with God. We thank you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.